بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أنا الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمد عبده ورسوله أما بعد Before we begin, Ikhwan, I just want to bring to your attention the really important and fundamental aspect of the religion of Islam. And I do this because if we don't continue to do this, especially in front of our children, slowly but surely, Islam will fade away. As the Prophet said in the authentic hadith, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, يَدْرُسُ الْإِسْلَامِ كَمَا يَدْرُسُ وَشْيُ الثَّوْبِ Islam is going to fade away the way the embroidery of a person's thobe fades away. So when you buy a shirt and it's brand new, the shirt has dark ink in it and it's new. But when you wear it, you wash it, you iron it, you wear it, you wash it, you iron it, you wear it, you wash it, you iron and so forth and so on, it becomes tattered. It starts to fade away. The ink is not as pronounced as it used to be. And the embroidery is not like it was when you first brought it. So the Prophet said, Al-Islam is going to fade away that same way. He said to the point that the people won't know the Ummah, they won't know what is Salat, they won't know what is Zakat, they won't know what is Sawm, they won't know what a nusuk is, Hajj. And then he told them, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, وَيُسْرَ عَلَى كِتَابِ اللَّهِ تَعَالَى فِي لَيْلَةٍ وَاحِدَةٍ حَتَّى لَا يَبْقَى فِي الْأَرْضِ حَتَّى لَا يَبْقَى فيها في الأرض منها آية to the point that no ayat of the Quran is going to be in the earth the Quran will be raised up in one night so these things that he mentioned in this hadith they are happening right now Al-Islam is going to fade away the way the embroidery of a thobe fades away and the Muslims are not going to know what the religion of Islam the religion that the Prophet brought وسلم, is going to be different than the religion that the people are upon right now so if you were to look at the Muslims right now, there are some people who they don't pray and they say with sincerity. They're not bad people, they have sincerity. They say Islam is in my heart. My heart is clear. My heart is pure. And he or she believes it's okay not to pray, not to wear hijab. And they're serious. They're not bad people. If someone were to come and they were to give everybody here a ticket to go and perform hajj or umrah, and Hajj is a pillar from the pillar of Islam. It's one of the pillars. Islam has five pillars. Islam is built upon those five pillars, predicated upon those five pillars. So and Hajj is one of the five pillars. You take the leg off of the chair. You take the leg off of the table. From under the table, the table is going to fall over. So if someone were to give us a visa, give us tickets to go and perform Hajj, most people don't know what they're doing. And when you perform Hajj, you see that with our Ummah. And that's how Islam is fading away. All of those are the kind of Al-Islam. Where I come from, where I'm living right now, there are some people who are around me who believe that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he knows the unseen, he knows the unseen. The Prophet never died. He lived forever and he never died. Although the Quran established he's going to die History clearly indicates he died, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And yet that Muslim, when it comes to la ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, he doesn't know what that really means and what it entails. So with that being the case, I want to just make this point about these types of sittings. And I'm only making this point because of that. If we can help to prevent al-Islam from fading away, or any aspect of Al-Islam from fading away, we should do something about that. The Prophet, he was traveling, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and when he was traveling, he became tired. If he was created from the nur of Allah, if he wasn't a human being, he would have never become tired, but he became tired. And have a rahmah upon his companions, because he was stronger than them. He was stronger than them, he could have kept going. But he was having rahmah upon the people, so he stopped to take a rest, to take a break. So he pitched a tent over there, and the people just were spread out, and they were doing 
what they wanted to do. And he looked out of his tent and he saw people far away, like the people over there. He saw them far away. And he said to the companions, Mali Arakum Aizin. Why are you people sitting so far away from each other? In the he said, being far away like this is from the shaitan and it creates division in your hearts. So the Muslims are in need of unity. But not unity just based on the word. I give the microphone unity, unity, unity. Unity in a practical way. And he showed us how to unify ourselves because he came in a society that was divided. They were divided. The Arabs, they were divided. They were racist amongst themselves. The Ansar, they had groups. The Muhajireen, they had groups, different tribes. But when those companions, may Allah be pleased with them, took this religion, they showed us how to be united. And one of the most important aspects of Al-Islam is unity, being together. And it's not permissible for any Muslim to be a person who compromises the unity of the Muslims. And that happens in many ways. So we have to be united amongst ourselves, practically. And one of the ways that we get unity, inshallah, is that in these types of sittings, in these types of lessons, in the masjid, you brothers, if you don't have a medical problem, you shouldn't sit far away like that. You shouldn't. And I'm not saying this to put anybody out. If you want to remain there, you can remain there. But I'm just telling you that the Prophet, he saw his companions like this and he told them, don't sit like that. So what they did was, as soon as they heard that from him, they all came closer together. They all came closer together. And they said, when we used to come together with him, if you would have thrown the blanket out, the blanket wouldn't have hit the floor. So I want to kindly ask you brothers, without putting anybody down, kindly, and following the sunnah, and showing our love for the Prophet Sallallahu that you brothers in the back, if you can, move forward, move forward, and don't sit like that. Akhi, you brothers in the back, if you can come together, unless you have a medical problem. And this is the difference between the companions and the people today. That when you present some aspect of the religion, the people today, you say, I, I'm not doing that. And that's not important. But the companions, they were not like that. Prophet used to ask them to do simple things and sometimes very difficult things. And they were quick to do it. And that's why Allah gave them the situation that he gave them. And that's why we're in the situation that we're in because of al istikbar and people having, you know, a need. What I want to share with you, brothers, is something that is connected to the environment that we're dealing with right now, the atmosphere that we're dealing with right now, concerning the things that are happening in the Muslim world as well as in Europe where some Muslims from our ummah, some of them go overboard and they're extreme. And they want to defend al-Islam. And they want to defend the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa but they go overboard and they go in extreme. And in our religion, we have a religious obligation to defend al-Islam and defend the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but we have to defend them in the way that's correct. There's a person who wants to defend the religion by hook or crook. He wants to defend the religion by al-Islam or by kufr. He wants to defend al-Islam by a tawheed or a shirk. He wants to defend Islam by the sunnah or innovation. He wants to defend Islam by a sit or a kether. There is a hadith. He says, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, man kadhaba aliyya muta'amida fal yatabawwa maq'aduhu min al nar Anybody who lies on me intentionally, let him prepare his place in the hellfire. And that's because if you lie on the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you're making a new religion. When you say he said something that he didn't say, you're doing what the Jews and the Christians did. They made a new religion. So right now, Christmas is coming up, inshallah. And then Easter. And if you were to ask the Christians, what does the Christmas tree have to do with the birth of Jesus? What does these Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer 
Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer and all of that. What does that have to do with Jesus? They're going to say nothing. It just comes from people saying about their religion, just talking. So when we lie on the prophet, it's a problem. So a person will create a hadith that are not authentic. And you tell them that hadith, the prophet said, anybody who lies on me, let him prepare his place in the hellfire. That person said, I'm not lying on him. I'm lying for him. I'm lying for him. So I'll make up a hadith. For an example, divorce. Divorce is not a good thing when it's not done for the right reasons. If it's done for the right reasons, then it's okay because maybe two people came together and they were not for each other. The Prophet himself, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, divorced people. His wives, his companions divorced people. So divorce is not inherently evil, but if it's used the wrong way, it can be evil. So the person says, Prophet Muhammad said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the worst halal thing to Allah is divorce. Because he wants to stop people from getting divorced, so he says that hadith that's fabricated. He said, I didn't lie on the Prophet, I lied for him. He wants people to pray. So he'll make a hadith up and say, Prophet Muhammad said, anybody who prays this mini rakat is on this day or this time is going to go to Jannah. So when people hear that, they practice it and it encourages them to do that particular thing. But our religion is not in need of anybody lying for Allah, lying for the Prophet. So we have to do things the right way. That's the point. So if we want to do the right thing, there's a way of doing the right thing. So in light of the situation that's going on right now, we have to defend the Prophet of Al-Islam, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. These little brothers right here, these little Muslims, they have to know it's your responsibility to defend the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But you defend him according to your ability. The older people here, you have to defend him according to your ability. The women, you have to defend him according to your ability. The revert, you have to defend him according to your ability. So what I want to share with you today, inshallah, so I want to give you some examples of how the companions in the past defended him in different ways, which goes to show that Depending upon your situation, depending upon our circumstance, it would determine how we defend him. So listen, I'm going to tell you some incidents that happened. And some of these incidents, some of them are tough. I am not telling anyone to do this. But I'm trying to bring to your attention. I'm trying to expose you to how and what happened. How some of those companions defended him. They didn't always defend him the same way. It depends upon your circumstances, your power, your ability. It depends upon what's going on in your environment. So unfortunately, some of the people want to help Islam and defend Islam. They do it by hook or crook, like I told you. By haq or batil, sitq, kedhib, adil, or vulm. They don't care. The important thing is just let me do something. So if, in his opinion, defending the Prophet Sallallahu means in order to get rid of one person, this thing I don't like, he doesn't like that fire extinguisher. He wants to help Islam. Something about that fire extinguisher he doesn't like. So he wants to get rid of it. In getting rid of it, he kills everybody in this masjid to get rid of the fire extinguisher. We say to him, as everyone would agree, hey, what are you doing? That's insanity. What you're doing is insanity. So as these things happen in the world today, with Islamophobia, with the negative and the nasty things they say about Prophet Muhammad and about Islam, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we as Muslims, we have to hate it in our hearts. But when it comes to trying to do something about it, you have to know what you're doing. You can't be a person who throws caution to the wind and you just do anything that you want to do. Because if you behave that way, you may be trying to do something to please Allah, but because of the way you did it, you'll be a person that Allah is going to punish, that Allah is not pleased with you. And this is what we find today. 
So the first thing we want to mention is, everyone here knows that the best human beings are the prophets and the messengers. Salawatullahi wa salamu alayhim ajma'in. And Allah Ta'ala took a mithaq, an aqd, an ahd, a covenant, a contract from all of the prophets and the messengers from the time of Nuh all the way to Isa. Salawatullahi wa salamu alayhim. He said in the Quran, وَإِذْ أَخَذَ اللَّهُ مِثَاقَ النَّبِيِّينَ لَمَا آتَيْتُكُمْ مِنْ كِتَابٍ وَحِكْمَةٍ ثُمَّ جَاءَكُمْ رَسُولٌ مُصَدِّقٌ لِمَا مَعَكُمْ لَتُؤْمِنُونَ بِهِ وَلَتَنْصَرُنَّهُ Allah said, hey, Ummat al-Islam, reflect, remember, think about this. Allah took a contract from all of the previous prophets and all of the messengers. And he said to every prophet and messenger, after I gave you your book that I revealed to you, and after I gave you your hikmah, your sunnah, every prophet had his sunnah, like our prophet has a sunnah. And from his sunnah is what I told you. Don't sit on the wall like that. Every prophet had his sunnah. When I give you the book and I give you the sunnah, and then the Rasul comes to you, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You have to believe him and you have to help him. So every prophet and every messenger of the past, he was talking to his people the way I'm talking to you for an example. The prophet is there and he's talking to his people. And he used to tell his people, Muhammad is coming. Muhammad is coming. And Muhammad looks like this and he does this and he does this and he, and he was describing it. And he told his people, when Muhammad comes, I, the prophet, I'm going to step back and Muhammad is going to come first and all of us are going to have to follow him. We have to follow him and we have to believe in him and we have to help him. So the first point we want to make is that Allah, he made it an obligation for all of the prophets and the messengers who went before Prophet Muhammad. If Prophet Muhammad comes, you have to help him. So if Allah made that an obligation upon the prophets and the messengers and the best people, then we are the followers of the prophets and the messengers. We believe in Allah, we believe in the books of Allah, we believe in the angels, and we believe in the messengers. Part of believing in the messengers is that Prophet Muhammad Wasallam was told to all of those prophets and messengers, and everybody knew about it. And because he's the best human being and the best prophet, they were willing and ready, ready to help him if he came. So that's the first point. That all of the prophets and the messengers were going to help him. Second to that is what happened when he first became a prophet and a rasul, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The youngest kid from amongst us knows that when the Nabi, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, became a rasul, it happened with the revelation of Surat al-Alaq. Iqra bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq. When that incident happened and Jibreel came to the Messenger of Allah and squeezed him three times and he gave him these five ayat, Rasulullah was disturbed at what happened. He didn't know what was going on. So he went to our mother Aisha and he complained and he said, wrap me up, wrap me up. And he told this story. He thought something was wrong. She said, no, don't worry. Allah is not going to put you down. Allah won't give you khizyun. Allah won't put you down. You a good person. You do this, you do that, you do this. She said, come with me to my cousin. My cousin Waraka ibn Nawfil. He used to be a Christian. When the Prophet Sallallahu was in Mecca, this man, he was from the Arabs, he was a cousin of Khadija, and he used to be a Christian. So he had some knowledge of the Torah and knowledge of the Injil. Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told Waraka ibn Nufil the story. Waraka ibn Nufil wasn't surprised. He said to the Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam, "You know the one who came to you and squeezed you and gave you those words." He said, "That's the Namus, and Namus who used to come to Musa. That's Jibril, the archangel, letting him know you're not crazy, but what happened to them is happening to you. That's the Namus." And the man was old, Waraka was old. He said, oh, I wish I was young when your people put you out of Mecca. 
Rasulullah said, and are my people Quraysh, they gonna expel me and put me out of Mecca? Waraka ibn Nufa said, yes. No man ever came with this message that you came with, except people became his enemies. His people became his enemies. And then Waraka said, I wish I was young so that I can help you. When they put you out, I can't help you now because I'm old. I'm old. I can't do anything. 80 years old. He said, but if I was young, I would defend you and I would help you. So that's the second point. Waraka ibn Nofal was a Christian. He had exposure to the Torah and the Injil. He knew something about Rasulullah. He knew something about Jibril coming in Revelation. And he knew enough to say, if I was young, I would have helped you when they tried to attack you. So for that reason, some of the scholars, for your information, they said that Waraka ibn Nawfal is a Muslim. So when you hear his name, you should say, Radhi Allahu Anhu. The Prophet said about him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, La tasubbu Waraka ibn Nawfal, fa inni ra'aytu lahu jannatan o jannatain. Do not curse this man, Waraka ibn Nawfal. Because I saw he was given one jannah or two jannahs. Some scholars said he wasn't a Muslim. But sometimes we get that question, who were the first Muslims? Many people say Rasulullah wasallam, and then Khadija and then Abu Bakr. And that could be true. But other scholars said no. Waraka ibn Nawfil became a Muslim before everybody else. Because he knew, he had a background. But the real point here is, Waraka ibn Nawfil said what? Ya laytani kuntu jada'an. I wish I was young when your people put you out. Because when they put you out, I would have been there to help you. So he knew he had to help them. So the prophets and the messengers, they were told you have to help him. Waraka ibn Nawfal, the old man, when he heard about the story and he knew he was a prophet, he knew Ali Iman necessitated, dictated, he must help him. Third example. Now again, I told you guys, I'm going to tell you some examples. I'm not telling anybody to do this. Just listen to me and understand the point. Third example about helping him is what happened in Mecca when the environment was hostile. And the companions, they would have wished that they could live during our time with this Islamophobia. Because what's going on right now is just a walk in the park compared to what they had to go through. And that's why Allah knew he has hikmah. He knew that they had to be there during the time of the Nabi because if he chose us, we were not the people for that job. Because when you tell people today, hey, hey, don't sit way back there, come over here. The person just looks at you like that. Whereas those companions, he would tell them big things that they had to do that required big efforts. And they would just do it without asking any questions. So it was very difficult for them. One time the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was at the Kaaba and the non-Muslims of Quraysh were over there and they were getting drunk and they were drinking. They were getting high. And in the state of being drunk, they said to one of the ignorant people, go and get the intestines off of the ground from the camel. Go get his intestines. Someone slaughtered the camel. The camel defecated. Akramakum Allah. Go get the defecation in the intestines and put it on him so that man went he took it and he put it on the Nabi and his companions were sitting right there and they saw everything Abu Bakr, Umar had been a Muslim that day Uthman, Ali, strong people they were watching so the man put the intestines and the defecation on the Nabi not a single companion moved they just watched they didn't do anything the one who moved was his daughter, who was a little girl, Fatima. May Allah be pleased with her. Fatima came and she wiped it off and she cleaned the Prophet ﷺ with her own hands. Because her hand, her hand compared to the Sunnah is nothing. Nothing. It's like Prophet Muhammad ﷺ, he was about to pray and he was going to say Allah Akbar, but he saw someone spit on the wall facing the Qibla. He took his clothes and he wiped someone's spit off. And it was the spit, that stuff. 
Now, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to say, somebody give me some tissue. I'm going to wipe it off. But the Nabi wasallam wiped it off because he told the people, don't spit towards the Qibla. Respect the Qibla. This is from the Sha'air of Al-Islam. So he wanted to teach the people, hey, when you spit, spit and cover it up with your left foot. Don't spit on the right side. So our religion told us everything we need to know. How, where to spit, what direction, what direction not to split, spit. But he cleaned it off with his own clothes showing this masjid is important. It's more important than my clothes. So Aisha, uh, uh, Fatima, she wiped it off with her own hands. But she just didn't do that. She went to the non-Muslims of Quraysh who were getting drunk. And when the man put that on them, they started laughing. They thought it was a joke. So she read to them an ayat from the Quran. And the ayat is in Surah Al-Furqan. And it's important that you know, Surah Al-Furqan is a surah that was revealed before the Hijrah in Mecca. There was no jihad. No jihad. It hadn't been legislated. There was no fighting. It hadn't been legislated. But the ayat is talking about a man who believed in Musa when Musa came to Fir'aun. And the man used to hide his religion. He was afraid for himself. But he couldn't take it anymore when Fir'aun was giving Musa a problem. So the man came out and the man said, the man said to Fir'aun, أَتَقْتُلُونَ الرَّجُلَ لَنْ يَقُولْ رَبِّيَ Allah." Do you kill a man? Do you fight against Musa? Because he said, my Lord is Allah. My Lord is Allah. This ayat is not in Surah Al-Furqan. The ayat that's in Surah Al-Furqan that I want to deal with is what Allah told the Prophet and the Muslims at that time. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, radiallahu anhu. Allah told them in Surah Al-Furqan, Jahid hum bihi jihadan kabira. Fight against these non-Muslims. Fight them with it. The big jihad. Fight these non-Muslims, these drunk people. Fight them with it. Fight them with it, the big jihad. The meaning of fight them with it, the big jihad. Fight them with the Quran. Fight them by talking and expressing yourself and explaining to them what the Quran is saying about Allah, about righteousness, about being fair. So Fatima was a young girl and she understood that. So she said this ayat to those people. Do you do this to my father, to a man, simply because he said, my Lord is Allah? This is the third example. She defended Al-Islam. She defended the Sunnah. How? With her tongue. With her tongue. Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali, Khalid ibn Walid wasn't there at that time, but those companions, they didn't move. Why didn't they move? Because the Prophet taught them. We're in Mecca, we're weak right now. Don't do anything. If you get up and you do something, you hit them, something, they're going to kill you. And they're going to kill your relatives. And they're going to kill everybody in the community. And they're going to take your property. And Islam is not going to go forward. So everybody just sat and they watched what happened. The only one who was able to defend Islam and to give dawah was the little girl. That was it. And no companion sat there and felt, oh, I'm lesser than a man. Oh, I'm, none of them. Because this was what they had in their hands, the ability. So we have the prophets and the messengers. All of them, they have a mithaq. They have to defend the Nabi, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We have Waraq ibn Nawfil, the old man, like the old man in our community. He's an old man and he's weak. But if the prophet, something happens to Islam or the Nabi, we hate what happens, we have to do what we have the ability to do in the old man. And in this case, the little girl. Another example is the example of two brothers. Their names was Mu'adh and Mu'udh, the two sons of Ifra. May Allah be pleased with them. They hadn't reached the age of puberty. They didn't even have hairs yet. But the Nabi allowed these two young men to participate in the war of Badr because the Muslims needed the numbers and they were able to participate. So before the war, they said to the companion, Abdurrahman ibn Auf, one of them went to Abdurrahman ibn Auf and said, so that the other one didn't hear him, 
He said to him, Hey uncle, where is Abu Jahl? Where is Abu Jahl? He's young. He doesn't know Abu Jahl. He's from Medina. He's never been in Mecca. He said, where's Abu Jahl? Abdurrahman ibn Auf said, what do you want with Abu Jahl? Abu Jahl ain't no joke. That man is a serious personality. What do you want with Abu Jahl? He said, I took an oath that I'm going to kill Abu Jahl. I took an oath that I'm going to kill him or I'm going to die trying to kill him because he used to curse the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He used to say bad things, nasty things about him. And I don't like what he said. I'm going to deal with him. Abu Jahl said, okay, I'll show you. I'll show you when he comes. Then his other brother came and he didn't want that brother to hear. He said, uncle, uncle, where is Abu Jahl? He said, what you want with Abu Jahl? He said the same thing. He used to talk bad about the Nabi. So I said, I'm going to deal with him. He said, okay, I'll show you. When the war began and they saw Abu Jahl, Abdurrahman ibn Auf told these two young boys, 13 years old, 14 years old, he said, there's Abu Jahl right there. So without paying attention to anybody else, because if you're on the battlefield, you have to pay attention to your peripheral vision. Maybe the guy's going to shoot you with an arrow over here. Maybe he's going to get you from over there. They didn't care about that. They were focused, Abu Jahl. The two of them went to Abu Jahl and they knocked him down. And they dealt with Abu Jahl. That's how he died. That's how he was killed. The battle of Badr. After the war was done, they came to the Prophet Sallallahu and they were arguing with each other. The two brothers were arguing. One was saying, Ya Rasulullah, I did it. The other one was saying, no, I did it. Going back and forth. He said, show me your swords. They showed him his sword, their swords. And both of them had blood on their swords. The Prophet said, both of you did it. Both of you did it. Now, I'm not telling anybody here, and I'm not encouraging any young person here to take a sword and, sh and kill anybody. I'm making a point how the companions defended the Nabi. So nobody sit there and misunderstand me, and I'm encouraging you, you brung brothers, to go get a butcher's knife or a kitchen knife and kill somebody. This is what happened with those companions. So the two young boys, that's how they defended him. And why? Why did they do that? Abdurrahman ibn Auf said, why? Why? What's your problem? What you want? They said he, they, he used to curse the prophet. I'm going to get him. So we have all the prophets and the messengers defending him. We have Waraka ibn Nufil, the old man, defending him. We have Fatima, the young girl, defending him with her tongue. We have two, these two young boys in the land of fighting, at the place of war. The context is they're on the battlefield. That's the context. So they dealt with him in the battlefield. That's how they defended him. And they were young. Another example. Some of the Yehud, they came by and they passed by the Nabi wasallam, and they said to him, Assamu alayka ya Muhammad. Assamu, not assalamu. Assalamu alayka ya Muhammad. Poison unto you ya Muhammad. Death unto you. We hope you die. When the Prophet heard that, he said to them, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Wa alaykum. Whatever you said to me, back to you. Whatever you said. And Allah accepts my dua and he doesn't accept yours. So he said, Wa alaykum. Whatever you said to me, back to you. When Aisha heard what they said and she understood, she said to them, May the curse of Allah be upon you, you descendants of monkeys and pigs. She was upset because they said, death be upon you. Death be upon the sunnah. May Islam be destroyed. You Muhammad, you're a bad guy. You're barbaric. Islam spread by the sword. You did pedia. You a pedophile. She heard that. The Muslim lady heard that. She got upset. She said, you, may the curse of Allah be upon you. You descendants of monkeys and Jews. The prophet heard and he said, hey, 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 Aisha, Aisha. Rifqin, Rifqin, take it easy. She said, Ya Rasulullah, didn't you hear what they said to you? He said, yeah, I heard what they said. Did you not hear what I said? I said to them and to you too, whatever you said. And then he advised that he said, be gentle. Because gentleness is never put inside of something except that it beautified it. And it was never taken outside of something except it made it ugly. And you're being rough and tough. 
And that word that you said to them, that's not gentleness. You want to defend me? Don't defend me by, by hook or crook. Don't defend me by any words, by any means necessary. Don't defend me by committing shit, bida, khurafat, injustice. Don't defend me like that. Defend me in the correct way. So now we have the prophets and the messengers. They have to defend him. Everybody has to defend them. We have the old man, Waraq ibn Nawfal, has to defend them. We have the two young boys, they have to defend them. We have the young girl, Fatima, you have to defend them. The grown lady, Fatima, uh, Aisha, the wife, the relative, but she was a grown woman, she has to defend them. Another example, Ikhwani, and there are many, and I only have 10 minutes now, so I have to pray. Eight o'clock, I was told. So we're going to skip those other examples of the human beings and give you this other situation. There was a man, his name was Abdullah ibn Abi Sir. He used to write the revelation. He was one of the few people who could read and write. So he was one of the scribes of the Prophet ﷺ. He used to write the Quran down. And not a lot of people had that ability. He was one of them. And not only was he a person who can read and write, but he memorized Surah Al-Baqarah. He memorized Surah Ali Imran. He memorized Surah Al-Nisa. He memorized Surah Al-Ma'ida. That's a lot of the Quran. He memorized that. Anyway, he decided to apostate and he left this religion. He became a kafir, a murtad. He left Islam and he was a katib of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he memorized a lot of the Quran. And yet, he became a non-Muslim. Everybody here without any istithna, no exceptions. Everybody here can become a non-Muslim before he wakes up tomorrow. No one should ever feel, I'm going to be a Muslim forever. You have to be afraid for yourself. So the people of the past, the salaf of this ummah, they said as long as a person is alive, you are prone, susceptible to fitna. Today a person is on the sunnah, tomorrow he can be on innovation. Today a man goes to bed as a Muslim, a mu'min, he'll wake up in the morning as a kafir. And it can happen for many reasons. He starts to drink khamar. That's the first step. Takes drugs, that's the first step. And as it progresses, he leaves Islam. He gets married, she gets married to the wrong person. Some of you people come from countries where people exist who curse their companions. You marry your relative, you marry your daughter to someone like that. Your daughter used to be on the sunnah. But when she gets under the authority and the supervision of a man who curses the companions, before you know it, she starts to be the people who curse the companions. So never ever, you young brothers, everybody here, never be one of those people who your religion is, your religion is whatever the sheikh says, the sheikh, the sheikh, the sheikh said it. Don't let your religion be this person or that person. Your religion has to be the proofs, the Quran and the Sunnah. We respect scholars, we respect them. But my religion is not what the scholar said or did. The scholar, he's open to be in fitna, everybody. This man used to write the revelation. And he wasn't the only one. He was the only companion who wrote revelation and he apostated. But there were other companions when the Prophet Sallallahu made al-Isra wa al-Mi'raj and he came back. Some people left Islam. When they heard that story, Muhammad said he went from Mecca to Beit al-Maqdis. From Beit al-Maqdis in Palestine, he went to the seven heavens and he came back in one night. When some of them heard that, some of them left Islam. And they saw the moon split. They saw water come out of his fingers. They saw a lot of miracles. But when he said that, it was too much for some of them. And they apostated. At the end, at the end, at the end of his life, when he died, sallallahu alayhi wa there were some people who apostated. They left Islam. They left Islam. So everybody here knows, for an example, the position of Umar. Umar, Umar may Allah be pleased with him. He said to a companion, his name is Hudhaifa ibn al-Yaman. 
He said, Ya Hudayfa, did the Prophet, when he told you the names of the hypocrites, the munafiqeen, did he say I was one of them? And Huday, how, how can Umar be a munafiq when Umar, may Allah be pleased with him? The Prophet said, Lokana Nabi Mbadi Nakana Umar. If there was a Prophet after me, it would have been Umar. He said that Abu Bakr and Umar are the best human beings after the Prophets and the Messengers. How and why would Umar say such a thing? Because he was afraid for himself. Hypocrisy. And now the people we're living right now, we live in a way as if we've been promised Jannah. There's a man from the Tabi'een. His name is Abdullah ibn Abi Mulaika. Abdullah ibn Abi Mulaika. Qal. أَدْرَكْتُ ثَلَثِينَ مِنْ أَصْحَابِ النَّبِيِّ صلى الله عليه وسلم كل واحد منهم يخشى على نفسه النفاق لا يقول أحدهم أنا على إيمان جبريل ومكائيل That man said I met 30, 30 of the companions He didn't meet all of the companions He said I met 30 of them All of them were afraid of nifaq on himself None of them said my iman is like Jibril and Mikail. He met Ali, he met Aisha, Abdullah bin Mas'ud, Amr bin al As. He met Asma, the daughter of Abu Bakr. He met some serious companions. So the point here is no one has the right to exist. No one being judgmental towards other people and you think and you behave and we act as if I'm in Jannah. So that man, that man, he apostated. When he apostated, he became a Christian. He's not the first one. There were other people who apostate and they became Christians. He became a Christian. He went to the Christians and he said to the Christians, you know this Quran? I'm the one that used to write it. I was writing the Quran for Muhammad. That Quran, I made it up. Muhammad is a kadhab, he's a liar. So the scholars who gave the tafsir and the asbab of Nazul, they said that the ayat of the Qur'an where Allah Ta'ala mentioned وَمَنْ أَذْلَمُ مِنْ مَنْ أَفْتَرَى عَلَى اللَّهِ كَذِبًا أو قال وقال أوحي إلي ولم يوحى إليه شيء ومن قال سأنزل مثل ما أنزل الله Who is more oppressive than the one who lies on Allah and the one who says revelation came to me or and no revelation came to him or he says I'm going to reveal the way Allah revealed they said that this ayah was revealed because of this man because he said he wrote the Quran anyway Akhwani the man he was one day minding his own business doing something with his horse his horse kicked him in the head kicked him in his head cracked open his head broke his neck cracked open his head and broke his neck the people came and they buried him in the ground. When they buried him in the ground, the next morning the ground threw him out. So when the people came and they saw his body there, they said, look how angry Muhammad is with this. Muhammad and his companions, they were upset that this man left their religion. Look at what they did. They, 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 un they took him out of the ground and put him on the ground. So they dug him the next day, they dug him deeper. The next day they came, his body was outside of the ground. They said, wow, we can't believe how upset they are. They're so angry that the man apostated and he came with us to Christians. So they buried him deeper and they put some cement type stuff at the top of the grave. The next day they came, the man's body was outside of the ground. They said, this is not from Muhammad and his companions. This is something special. So they left the man's body outside of the ground because they realized the ground is throwing the man outside of the ground. The ground wouldn't accept and wouldn't embrace the body of the man. So the ground itself, the earth itself, it was defending the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. There are other examples, serious examples, like the blind man who couldn't see. And he had a lady who was a slave during his time. And that man used to speak bad about the Prophet Sallallahu And he told that lady, you better stop doing that. You better stop. You better stop. And she wouldn't stop. So one day he got upset and he killed that lady. He cracked open her head. And he cut open her stomach. And she was pregnant. And the baby came out. I'm not telling anybody to do this. I'm telling you an incident that happened. 
So understand the context. The blind man knocked on her floor, got on her shoulders, cracked open her head, and stabbed, and the baby came out, killed the lady and the baby. When the news spread, and the Prophet found out about it, the man came to the Nabi Sallallahu He said, what made you do that? Because it's a big thing, you kill someone. This is a big thing, kill a human being. And you kill a baby, didn't do anything to you. What made you do that? The man said, Ya Rasulullah, that lady is the mother of two of my children that I love a lot. But she kept doing this. She, <coughs> she kept saying bad things, bad things, bad things. So that I got upset and I killed her. Brother Muhammad told those people who were looking, so I verily her blood is halal. He allowed what that man did because that man is the Sayyid, that man is the master. During that time in Islam, if you have a slave, if a person has a slave, it's permissible in Islam for the master to do the hajj on the slave. That's in Islam. No one in here can do the hajj. No one. No one. You know the hudud in Al-Islam. Flogging people for mistakes that they made. The different things. I'm not afraid to say that. I'm not afraid to say what the hudud are. Meaning, no one, the imam of this masjid, the administration, no one can do that. It has to be the responsibility of the Muslim leader. He's the only one. But if a man has a slave and his slave stole something or did something wrong, he can do the hud on his slave. So in that context, the Prophet allowed that thing to happen. So the point here is, and I'm going to finish with this to wrap it all up. When it comes to defending the Prophet ﷺ, defending Islam during this time that we're living in, in France, in the UK, in America, in the Muslim world, but especially in Europe and in America, we have to defend the Prophet ﷺ knowing what our situation is. Some people did this, they only said something, other people did that. It is depending upon what's going on with the Muslims. And no one in his right mind, no Muslim in his right mind would ever say that the Muslim community in America, in Europe, we're in a position where we have power and strength, where we could be rough and tough. We're in a power of weakness. Like when they put the intestines and the defecation on his shoulder in Mecca. And Abu Bakr and those companions sat there. And they didn't do anything about it. That's the time we're living in. Where? We have to hate it in our heart. Or we speak out about it the way Fatima spoke out about it. As for taking the initiative and doing crazy things, then all we do is we open up the door to give the people ammunition to reject this religion. We give the non-Muslims the ability to say, yes, those Muslims are crazy. And then if you look at so many other examples where bad things happen and the companions allowed it, Prophet Muhammad allowed it. He was invited to have some dinner or lunch with a Jewish lady. He went along with his companions and they all sat down and they began to eat. Jibril came to the Prophet and said, don't eat, the meat is poison, it's poison. But he had already ate some and they already ate some. But because he's stronger than everybody, those people died. His companions started dying. The Nebi, he didn't die because he was stronger. And Allah is going to protect them. Wallahu ya'asimuka min al nas. Allah is going to protect them. But when he was dying, when he was dying years later, he said to the companions, when he was dying, he said, I still feel the pain from the poison that I ate that day. I still feel it. Anyway, he didn't die. But he didn't kill that lady who gave him that poison. And she tried to kill him. But he didn't kill her. Why didn't he kill her? He had just got to Medina. He doesn't want to be fighting everyone. He has to get the community stabilized. If he goes to Medina, as soon as he gets to Medina, he starts fighting everybody. The religion is not going to grow. He allowed that. There's a man, his name was Dhul Khuwaisira. Dhu al Khuwaisira. He came to the Prophet and he grabbed him like this and squeezed him. He said, Ya Muhammad, give me some more money. Give me some more money. Umar said, Ya Rasulullah, let me chop his head off. He's a munafiq. Anyone who grabs you like this, anyone who deals with the sunnah like that, you're not a real Muslim. Someone who comes and says, 
Give me the Quran. It's enough. Don't give me the Sunnah. You're not a real Muslim. You're lying. You can't practice Islam with just the Quran. That man grabbed him. When the Prophet took his hand off and he let his collar go, it was, you could see the red in his skin because the man was so tight. Um, I said, let me kill him. Prophet Muhammad said, no, 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 Umar. Do you want the people, if I kill him, the news is going to spread. Go to the desert. Propaganda. They're going to say, if you're with Muhammad, if you're his companion, if you believe with, with him, and he doesn't like what you said, he'll kill you. He didn't want that to happen. He weighed the situation. That man deserved to get done. He deserved it. And plus, from him came fitna that we're dealing with today. Prophet Muhammad could have stopped that fitna that we're dealing with today. But he didn't. Why? Because at that time, it was better to leave him. And that man deserved it. And there are many examples like that. Where he let people go because he weighed the situation. So that's my message to you, brothers. My message to the community here is, we have to relax and we have to calm down. If something happens that we don't like, like our brothers in Palestine are being oppressed, something bad happens in Iraq, in Syria, anywhere, Kashmir, anywhere. I'm not saying we should clap about it and be happy. I'm saying we should be up, upset about it, but we have to deal with it in the right way. We have to deal with the situation in the right way. Don't create a bigger problem. Don't create a bigger problem. So this is what we wanted to share with you brothers, especially you young brothers. Don't be like the young people who do crazy things because you're not going to find a man from amongst our community who's 60, 70 years old. You're not going to find him going doing crazy things like this. These things are always done by young people who their brains are not fit, they're not fully developed yet, and they are moving off of emotions. In our religion, there's a place and a time for emotions. But there's always a place and time for having knowledge and knowing what we are doing. May Allah accept it from us, accept it from you guys. And may he protect our ummah from these actions that do nothing but harm our religion. Now, concerning what happened recently in California, I don't know the details of that. I'm still, the, the, the jury is still out as far as I'm concerned. I'm trying to figure out what's going on. I don't believe everything that the newspaper tell me, the media tell me about this or that. But I do know that we have people from our community who are rough and tough. So don't be a conspiracy theorist and disbelieve everything. You have to know how and what to take from the media. Everything they say, you can't believe it. But it's not acceptable to reject everything that they claim because some of us know firsthand without any doubt there are people from this ummah who are rough and tough. They have no knowledge of the religion and they do do some crazy things. But I'm not saying any specific situation. I'm just saying generally speaking. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika wa shadu wa la ilaha ila anta staghfiruka wa tubu ilayk. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.